Good morning, friends and family. I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How good it is to worship together with you today, even if we are still separated, many of us gathering together in the sanctuary, as well as many of us still in our homes or maybe even across the country, let alone across the world. But I pray that the presence of Christ reminds us of, of hope, that no matter where we are, God is indeed with us. As I also pray that the presence of God invites us to not just simply cower and wonder what God is looking at or what God is displeased with, but that the presence of God certainly does call us to a place of confession and repentance, a place of healing, a place of true and authentic change, but also to a place of declaring our connectedness as the people of God by God's Spirit around the mission of God to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We have been given the awareness during these days especially that the heart of God beats not just in the sky somewhere way off, that we should know compassion and mercy, but that we as the people of God should live and act as a people of compassion and mercy. I love our scripture readings for today because they not only call us to that awareness of what it means to be the people of God, hearing the call and the connection to be the people of God, to both rest in the calling of God, but also to be actively taking risks for the sake of the calling of God, but that they also invite us to become aware of the world around us in which God loves every single human being and whereby we have an opportunity by the, the, the participation with that love and compassion and mercy to help grow faith and hope in the ways in which we proclaim together with God the message as God's Spirit uses us to be witnesses in all that we say and do. I want to invite you then to look with me at our scripture readings today, the first one being our psalm reading, coming to us from Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. And I would invite you to follow along in your Bible today. Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12. The psalmist says something extremely important to us, especially in this moment in human history. The psalmist says, Oh, I must find rest in God only, because my hope comes from Him. Only God is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. My deliverance and glory depend on God. God is my strong rock. My refuge is in God. All you people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Human beings are nothing but a breath. Human beings are nothing but lies. They don't even register on a scale taken all together. They are lighter than a breath. Don't trust in violence. Don't set false hopes in robbery. When wealth bears fruit, don't set your heart on it. God has spoken one thing. Make it two things that I myself have heard that strength belongs to God and faithful love comes from you, my Lord, and that you will repay everyone according to their deeds. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Turn with me now, if you would, then to our Old Testament reading, which is found in Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And then I want to jump over to verse 10 to conclude that reading. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and then verse 10. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh was indeed an enormous city, a three days walk across. Jonah started into the city walking one day and he cried out, just 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them and he didn't do it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What great hope there is for us that we don't just simply engage in this mission of the good news, that we might thump on the world and make the world feel awful and bad as if somehow they deserve our wrath, but that instead that they might be given an opportunity to, to see the good news lived out in us, that in us and through us the world might know the love of our Creator, the love of the God that we have joined in relationship that we then might be able to celebrate not just them moving towards us, but that the move of God's kingdom being brought here on earth as it is in heaven, all, the, all places, everywhere, to God be the glory. Would you join me then to that end in prayer? 
Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship together today. We ask that in this time of worship, you would direct our attention to your heart that beats for the lost. For those who maybe don't feel very lost, but maybe have in some ways exhibited even better than those who have known what it means to be found, to be good, kind, and gracious to our neighbors. Help us, O oh God, to engage your witness, to proclaim your good news. Help us, give us a vision of what the world in which we live looks like, that we might know how it is that we might take the risk of sharing your good news, not just from our lips, but with our lips, but from the entirety of our, our beings. Lord, that the world might know, that healing might happen, that people's lives might be transformed. Help us, O oh God, that we might know the hope of our faith here today, in this place and around the globe, for your glory. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. What if the world were a village of 100 people? 51 people in the village would be boys, 49 would be girls. There would be 60 Asians, 14 Africans, 12 Europeans, 8 Latin Americans, 5 from the United States and Canada, and 1 from the South Pacific. The village would have 18 cars, 33 villagers would own cell phones, and one would be dying of starvation. 30 villagers would be unemployed. 53 villagers would live on less than $2 a day. 80 would live in substandard housing. 24 wouldn't have any electricity. 33 would be able to read. And 16 people would have access to the internet. If the world were a village of 100 people, God still would have sent his son to die for them. And he'd love each and every one of them all the same, with the same endless depth, the same passion, the same grace. All 100 will need Jesus. 33 would know him as their Lord and Savior. One would be actively telling others about him. Is it you?
sun for there to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine but chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy brings unending Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are good. You're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, and let the king of my heart
So evangelism is about becoming good news in the world and conquering people is never good news to them. Well, it's for their good. No, <laughs> conquering people is not for their good, it's for your good. And so forms of uh, church planting or disciple making or anything like that that are, that are about conquering people and taking away their culture and imposing your culture that uh, any form that has to do with uh, sort of taking over a neighborhood and putting a foreign DNA into it as if your DNA is better, there's a problem with that. When Jesus came into the world, he came as in a particular culture. He be came into the world as a Jew, living in this little town that is uh, that was um, scoffed at by people outside of that town. Jesus came into the world uh, in a specific culture. He ate the food, he wore the clothes, he went to school where the kids in the neighborhood went, he got the viruses that were going around and that sort of thing. And so what that tells us is that the gospel coming into the world, the, the word of God made flesh, has to happen in every specific culture. But the culture itself is also subject to the scrutiny of the gospel. <laughs> so every culture has its flaws. Every culture has its blind spots and its ways that it hurts people. So the gospel is made flesh in a culture, and yet it critiques the culture. What this means is that when we bring the gospel into the world, we have to live in the neighborhood, uh, live in the neighborhood as robustly as we can, love our neighbors, get to know them, understand their strengths, know the stories, become part of the story of the neighborhood. And in the process of that, we ourselves will be called to a deeper conversion to the gospel. And we will both bring Jesus to the neighborhood and receive Jesus from the neighborhood. What is, what is, the, what is the gospel and what are, you, what are you bringing and why isn't Jesus there? Jesus is already there, but uh, in an incomplete way. <laughs> What I mean by that Jesus is, is <laughs> the expression, the expression of God's love, and God's transformation of the world, the healing of what is broken, the bringing of shalom. That calls for all of us to participate, and so uh, bringing the gospel to a neighborhood means bringing the love of God that is determined to make all things new. Bringing that into the neighborhood with you and recognizing where that's already bubbling up in the neighborhood, you know, apart from you, before you ever got there, and collaborating, participating in that. God is not locked in the church. God is out, out in the world, and the church gets to participate in God's mission in the world. But ultimately it's to get like, people on the parking team and <laughs> leave a small group though, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, it seems to me that we're, we're on the edge of a big shift. We're on the edge of a great awakening again. And the church is going to look very different in the future than it has looked to us in the recent past and even the last few hundred years. So what will that all look like? I don't know exactly. I just know that emergence is happening all around. And that means that church is more about people gathering and learning from each other and being a blessing than it is about programs and buildings and uh, that sort of thing. What does that have to do with salvation? Huh? Well, you know the root word of salvation, salve, is a Latin word that means healing. <laughs> so Cut! I can't sell that. <laughs> salvation is for here and now as well as in eternity. When Jesus came into the world, he said, the kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of God is with you. He was talking about now as well as later. And when he taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray that uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means that salvation is for now and not just after this life. What do you see being saved? Where's the kingdom coming? What do I see being saved? Well, in one way, um, we're being saved from ourselves. <laughs> we're being saved from systems and um, 
structures that are that are evil, frankly, that are oppressive and death dealing. So we're finding salvation to lead us out of that, to lead us out of every kind of hell that we put ourselves into and that we impose upon other people. But this is the mission of the church is to go to hell. When Jesus said to Peter, your name is Peter and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so Jesus was kind of envisioning hell as a gated community and uh, saying that the role of the church is to break down those gates and go into that gated community and lead people out into life and freedom. That's our job. So when you think about, you know, where should we plant a church? Where should we be church? Well, we need to look around for the local hell and go there. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? We often are working so hard to avoid hell and to move our way towards heaven that we forget about the gospel call, don't we? We forget about what it means to step into, as we might say, the highways and the byways, the alleys, or even the streets that make us scared. What does that mean for us to consider the gospel that is to be proclaimed to a world around us? When I was in junior high, my parents built a house, and I used to love going into the house when they were building that house. And it, it was always a grand opportunity for me to see new tools and to, to see some amazing ways in which the guys that were building it were doing their jobs. One tool in particular always stood out to me as being so fascinating, and yet it was probably one of the most simple tools that was there. It was, yes, the amazing chalk line. You've probably seen one of these. It's a pretty simple device. It's this little uh, reservoir, if, uh, if you will, that, that holds colored chalk. And a string is stuck inside of it. And I won't pull it out because it'll get all over everything here up in the platform. But I, I loved the simplicity of that where you would drag it then between two points and you would snap the line and it would leave this chalk line where you were either supposed to cut or you were to lay a wall, whatever it might have been. I have come to a realization that we as Christians often, when we consider the proclamation of the good news in a world in which people are living truly in, in an existence of, of life in hell here and now, that we maybe sometimes have taken somewhere along the way and snapped a line that we believe to be the borders of good news and bad news. And that we then have assumed that our job is to stand on the one side of it, the good side, if we will, and to declare to the world around us that they better figure out how to get on this side or else they are on the outs. Well, I don't think that's necessarily the message that God is inviting us to share. Neither in, as Elaine Heath has said, in some very provocative ways, to be able to be manipulative of the individuals around us, assuming that we have the world that works, and we now need to make them live the world that we have lived. Or that we should somehow step into the world and start out, even before getting to know their own names, even before greeting our own neighbors, declare to them how they should be doing what they should be doing, just like us. In the text that we're going to look at today from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, there is this move from John proclaiming the good news to Jesus making a declaration of the kingdom being inaugurated during his ministry, during his moment, during his time, and all that he is about to declare, and the calling of those first disciples. The language shifts from is somehow attaining to this, this repentance call in which we are simply supposed to straighten up and the invitation of those early disciples to be a participant in the proclamation of the gospel, they themselves having repented, now responding with the good news. And Jesus uses in this text the language of becoming fishers of persons. I think that's a, a great metaphor that we can work with today for a few moments as we look out at the world around us with hope with the, the possibility of this call continuing to be strong and fresh in each and every one of our lives. 
even though it's very realistic as we look out of the world that the fish around us have grown smarter, but that I believe there is a sense in which we have been called to be more faithful with the proclamation of the gospel, not just from our lips, but from the story that is our lives as we care and love and offer and extend the grace and the mercy of God to the people around us. I was just reading my own devotions this morning, how it is that the people of God are invited to consider that even when Jesus was getting, getting drawn to a place of, of continuously doing the work that He was doing without having spent time before the Father, that Jesus then snuck off and the people followed Him and it would have easily aggravated Jesus. But the Gospel says to us that when Jesus saw the people, He had compassion on them. Is that true of you when you look out at the world around you, whether it be newscasters or whether it be your neighbors or whether it be your co-workers or family members? Is the heart of God that beat in Jesus' chest beating in yours? And dare I say, as we look at this text in Mark's Gospel, is it in your tackle box as we fish for the people that God has placed within our lives? To that end, I would invite you to join me for a few moments in Mark's Gospel as we look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And I'm going to ask those who are gathered together with us in the sanctuary, if you would, to stand in honor of God's Word as we look at this text. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew. They were fishermen, so they were throwing fishing nets into the sea. Come follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and followed him. After going a little further, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment, he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. In Jesus' day, the call was more radical. I mean, we can't just simply say that he said he wanted somebody to take up a new job. It's a matter of livelihood. It's a matter of, of the historical call of those who are living in the midst of a particular practice and pattern that was generational. But it was also to repentance. And not just for the filthy heathens, but for the church that had walked away from the, dare we say, the hell holes that fellow humans swarm in. That the message of the people of God would be one that truly offered good news. Jesus even said it in verse 15, change your hearts and lives, but not just because you should, but because you can trust the good news. And to trust the good news, you also then need to trust those who proclaim the good news. One of my favorite authors, N.T. Wright, wrote a, a commentary series that is really accessible to all of us entitled The Everyone Series. In the Mark for Everyone series, he says this, so Jesus came to the Galilean villages as a wandering prophet, not a stationary one like John, a messenger urgently, urgently needing to tell people what was going on. And his message was that God's time had come. The moment had arrived. If you were to walk down the street of any town or village with any Christian background and were to call out, repent and believe the gospel, people would think they knew what you meant. Give up your sins and become a Christian. Of course, Jesus wanted people to stop sinning, but repentance for him meant two rather different things as well. First, it meant turning away from the social and political agendas which were driving Israel into a crazy, ruinous war. We can imagine someone saying that today in a country where ideologies are driving half the population into violent behavior. Second, it meant calling Israel to turn back to a true loyalty to Yahweh, their God. And as anyone with a smattering of knowledge of the Bible would recognize, this was what had to happen before God would redeem Israel at last. The call to repent is part of the announcement that this is the time for the great moment of freedom, of God's rescue. That's why it goes with the call to believe. 
Jesus' contemporaries trusted all sorts of things, their ancestry, their land, their temple, their laws. Even their God provided that this God did what they expected him to do. Jesus was now calling them to trust the good news that their God was doing something new. To get in on the act, they had to cut loose from other ties and trust him and his message. Dare I say, his messengers, too. That wasn't easy then, and it isn't easy now. But it's what Peter, Andrew, James, and John did, and it's what all Christians are called to do today, to do tomorrow, and on into God's future. When I was a kid, my father and I would often go fishing. When we couldn't catch anything, we would usually declare the fish had somehow grown smarter. Truth be told, if we had done it right in the first place, they wouldn't have learned anything because we would have caught them the first time. Now I know, fishing is not catching. So to assume it is only about catching is also to devalue the fish who do indeed learn as prey that they have far too many things against them instead of for them. And so they act and walk cautiously, or should I say, swim cautiously, aware of those that are always around them. So think about that in terms of the people of God and the proclamation of this gospel call. When Jesus spoke, he was not inviting us to consider the world as prey, but to ask in what ways we had been co-opted by the enemy that preys about the innocent, the broken, and the lost around us. The Lord was considering and inviting us to consider the places and the ways that we might repent of our own versions of kingdom mindsets whatever those might look like, that the gospel may become truly good news to the world. What's that look like for you? I suppose as I read those words from N.T. Wright that were written several years ago, really outside of the context of some of what we've been experiencing in American culture, I, I, I read it now especially with interest. Interest that we should step out of our own agendas. Interest that we should be careful, especially as we might somehow allow our faith in Christ, our call to be disciples, to be mingled with what might be called Christian nationalism in these days. As well as other extremes, I will admit, that leave Jesus out of the story of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We can simply identify the materialistic move of Christians when we ourselves, as N.T. Wright has noted, just get mad because we want life to be for us rather than inviting us to be engaged in the lives of those around us. What does it look like? We have been called to embrace the kingdom call of God that takes us into perhaps uncomfortable places, even outside our own Western expression of what Christianity looks like. By the way, we need to note that here, that we have often owned the story of Christianity as one that is Western, and is not. It was in the Near Eastern, in Near Eastern history a, a story about God that now we need to see as a story of God for all people everywhere across the globe. <laughs> we often think that it came from the mouth of Jesus to the ears of Billy Graham, and that's not true. As grateful as we are for the ministry of such a wonderful evangelist, in history, who has done what he did. There is a sense in which we need to consider what it means for us to be new and fresh. I, I will say it here, and I know it's not very popular, and I, I know I'm trying to declare something that I believe and have seen, but I, I, I think that there's a grand expression that's lost when we ourselves take and move away from the call of God in some of the ways in which some of the newer evangelists have declared that we need to get angry or declare a particular person as the only way in which the kingdom of God is declared. We immediately are trying to call others to come back to our story, assuming that everybody out in that hole that we're fishing for is the one who's wrong and evil and that we are the only right. That's dangerous. My friends, I believe that we need to rethink with, with sheer honesty our moves toward evangelism that often are rooted in, 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 in trying to find a way not just for us to be happy or okay or content with the world around us, but to consider others healing, to consider the life of those around us that we don't just simply try to clean them up so that we somehow can make sure that our life is okay, but that we ask where they're hurting that we move beyond our experience or desire or proclamation for our own version of heaven, 
but that we offer authentically good news to those who are living in the midst of hell here on earth. My dear friends, the gospel is the critical element in this. You see, the desire of a global Jesus, a heavenly kingdom ultimately, is one where we can find the hellish existence of a hungry world and think of the risk of those fish to get to your worm. As well as our own self-surrender to God's kingdom inauguration, and again, we are not talking about American politics, but the good news of the kingdom, of Jesus, that it might be cast out from us, sent out into the waters of the world around us, that the love of God in and through us hooks people into an authentic relationship with Jesus, one that is bigger than us, but one that includes us. Not just as Elaine Heath chuckled for a moment about our desire to somehow win people to the Lord and then get them involved in the church building and the ministry of that building. No, bigger than that. To minister to the people for whom Jesus Christ came. To minister to the people for whom the love of God is cast upon the entire world. That everyone should know. That it's bigger than us just figuring it out by our own programs and participation uh, desires that we should somehow get them to do what we do or act like we want them to act. But offering to the world hope that is bigger, that is more distinct than anything that even the church has been able to discover to this point. But that the kingdom of God is proclaiming an opportunity to grow up through the orthodoxy that is the church into the wonderful orthopraxy that is the Holy Spirit actively engaged in us, helping us to be able to live and be and do in the world differently, more faithfully, beyond our own agenda. Recognizing the world has seen far too many people who have declared to be themselves to be witnesses of the good news, who have only bought, brought bad news, who have only brought their news, who have only offered the biases of their own life and that which would continue to make them comfortable. But may we step out in faith, trusting God, and may we offer something amazing as we become those who are trusted and trustworthy of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, as we become fishers of people. I want you to watch a video from somebody that I, I value quite highly in regards to what he has written over the years. Certainly as much as Elaine Heath is certainly provocative, and yet I think drives us to a thought process that may widen our approach to being the church. Not just doing church life, but being the church as we consider a world where it may be the world has grown a bit too smart. But yet we know that the wisdom of God will continually shape us, mold us, and make us that we become the story, that we become the word, that we become the witnesses of the good news of Jesus Christ, not because we are the end, not because we are all, but because we have been given the grand opportunity to share the good news, to put it into the water, to help others to know the good news of God's love. Watch this video with me for a few moments if you would. So the idea that the gospel is good news is really important because Jesus is saying that over and over. I mean, this is, this is about good news. And one of my friends said, I, I've listened to a lot of Christians and most of their news sounds like bad news. And sometimes it sounds like okay news. <laughs> and, the, and the gospel of Jesus is not okay news. It's not bad news. It's good news that God so loved the world that it's not about God just coming to condemn the world, but to save the world, to save souls, to save uh, all that, that is, is broken in the world. We, we Christians have been really good at making outsiders. You know, it's saying, are you in or out? Are you a believer or not? And I think we have to come to the point of realizing that the world doesn't exist in these categories of 100% Christian and 100% non-Christian. Uh, but there are some people that claim to be Christian that are looking less and less like Christ. And there's other people that would never call themselves Christian, but they look more and more like Jesus and the good news that He proclaims. So what we're to do is to move everything closer to Jesus and to pursue the kingdom of God with all that we are. And Jesus was so good 
at bringing people along who didn't feel like they were in. And he didn't have these insiders and outsiders like so much of the church does, but he's pulling the best out of everybody. And he's got a Roman tax collector and a zealot revolutionary, and he's going to challenge the tax collecting system, but he's, he's also going to challenge the sword of the zealots. He's going to have a Pharisee with a, 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 a prostitute or a, a woman that was marginalized, and they're going to come together, and they're all being transformed into a new creation. I heard one rancher talk about how you keep he was talking about raising cows so this is not really a story of community but he was saying uh, community might be like uh, by be like having a ranch with your cows and he said there's two different ways to keep your cows in one way is by creating a bunch of fences and he said but that's not the best way the best way to keep your cows in is to have a really good food source and so I think in a lot of ways, community is a little bit like that. Like, like uh, we can create community by building up walls and fences and locking people out and in. Uh, or we can have a really good source of life and food and sustenance that draws people and woos people in. And, uh, and I think that's the way that Jesus built community, is he's constantly calling people out of where they are and bringing them into a whole new space. And that's, that's the kind of communities we should be creating. Sing grace. 